Marie, uh, you just presented at the Micronutrient Forum Global Conference in Addis Ababa at the plenary on the platforms for quality delivery of micronutrients to achieve high coverage and use at scale. In your presentation, you spoke about local value chains for micronutrient rich foods. Is there sufficient data on that uh, that in, in the development context to say that they really contribute to nutrition security? Um, no, actually, um, that's one area where we have very little information. Um, we think that uh, value chains are uh, a type of platform that should be leveraged. The value chains, especially for micro and rich foods like dairy, animal source foods, um, and uh, fruit and vegetables, but there hasn't been much work done yet on how to do it, how to make those value chains a way to improve nutrition uh, by, for example, uh, if we take the example of dairy, making dairy products readily available for the poor, accessible, so that um, they can also be transformed along the value chain, they can be fortified, they can be transformed into yogurts that is easier to keep. So there are many ways to um, use value chains for nutritious food to, in an attempt to improve nutrition, but there's very little evidence uh, so far. Okay, so if you work under the hypothesis that agricultural programs actually contribute significantly to better nutrition, do you then think uh, one could claim a cause and effect uh, on women's empowerment in rural areas? Was that a far step? Um, yes, this is, this is an important pathway. Um, I, I have to say that there is more um, conceptual um, ideas related to how agriculture improves nutrition. We don't have much hard evidence from, let's say, um, randomized trials or experimental trials that show that agriculture really has made uh, an impact on improving, especially when we think of mothers and young children. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, targeted agriculture programs that have tried to improve nutrition, but their evaluations were not necessarily rigorous enough to get a concluding uh, statement about it. So we're still in, in doubt as to uh, what is the potential contribution of agricultural products to nutrition? And one of the things that many of us have done in recent years is think through very carefully what are the pathways, the multiple pathways by which agriculture can improve nutrition. And improving women's empowerment is one of the critical pathways. It's not just improving women's empowerment, but it's improving women's health, social status, nutrition, uh, as well as their decision-making power, and their, and their autonomy, all of those factors are very important intermediary uh, pathway by which agriculture can improve nutrition. But agriculture doesn't always empower women, and so we need to see agriculture programs, for example, make a specific uh, goal of em em empowering women, as well as make a specific goal of improving nutrition and having the types of interventions included in their program to do so. And when they do so, we do have evidence that agricultural programs can empower women and that this in turn um, is likely to have an impact on nutritional status. But all, connecting all those dots has not been done very well yet. And we're in the process of documenting that evidence. Uh, when I read in the preparation for the interview this line about the cause and effect uh, for empowerment, I, I pulled out the book by Bill Easterly on the tyranny of experts again. And I was thinking, because he makes the, the, the statement that you need to have proper rights for poor people first, and then things will come. So now I was wondering if the cause and effect could be also the other way around. Maybe you should work on, in your agricultural programs to have better empowerment of women, and that would cause for them to have better nutrition and then a virtual cycle would start. Is that an yeah. idea? I, um, I, I don't think anything happens by magic. So uh, I'm not a strong believer of, for example, just letting agriculture do its thing. And uh, for example, for, for the longest time, we've thought that increasing the amount of food available in the world 
and, and having agriculture be a driver of economic growth will by magic improve nutrition. Well, it doesn't. We have pro proven that it actually doesn't. If you don't do anything specific in addition to producing more food, you will not improve nutrition. And the same is true for empowering women or, or changing social norms or um, their rights to land and things like that. Those have to happen uh, not in any order, but simultaneously. Uh, it is true that if you go and, and have an agricultural program that promotes that women do agriculture, but if they don't have access to land, how is that going to help? Uh, so you need to do both at the same time. And we do have a study in Burkina Faso that demonstrates exactly that, that if you have both interventions at the same time, then you alleviate the constraints for this empowerment to happen and you promote it to, to happen. Uh, you, you get a lot more impact. I want to touch on the steering committee of Micronutrient Forum Global Conference 2014, where you sit on the steering committee, I believe. Um, maybe you can share with us uh, what the, the greatest highlight of the discussion on agriculture and food-based interventions is. Maybe a lesson learned as well. Um, we had a great session uh, on so-called food-based approaches. Um, and uh, the session focused on a lot on looking at uh, biofortification and, and uh, whether biofortified uh, foods are actually a good way to improve micronutrient status. Um, and the, the conclusion of that was that if you look at the um, bioavailability or the ability to absorb the micronutrients that are in biofortified foods, um, they are very bioavailable. The, there is a, a conventional breeding that can lead to crops that have a lot more micronutrients than, than the, the traditional ones, and those micronutrients are well absorbed and well utilized by the body. So it's re it really is a win-win um, solution. So the, the conclusions from the efficacy trials looking at how well these crops uh, can contribute to improving micronutrient sensors were very positive for all the crops and nutrient combinations. Um, so that includes crops that are rich in the staple crops that are rich in iron, zinc, or vitamin A. And so this is all very exciting and we finally have a, a body of evidence on, on, on its, uh, the usefulness of bioavailability. Now the next phase is to uh, work on the delivery, on the scaling up. Now that we know it works, we need to figure out the how. And that's a big issue that we discussed at the Microsoft Farm is that in many cases, we know what to do, but we really still are struggling with the how question. Um, another point about food-based approaches in general is that uh, in, in, in a session where I participated and I was asked to give some kind of concluding uh, comment, um, one point we need to remember is that food is really what should provide us with all the nutrients we need, the micronutrients as well as the calories. We should just have a balanced diet and not be constrained or limited. And if we have that, if everybody in the world had a good diet, diversified and, and, and healthy diet, we would not need any other interventions to improve micronutrient status. But we know this is not the reality. Uh, but it still means that at the basis of all the strategies the country should have in terms of how to improve micronutrient status, they should have the first intervention should be to try to improve the food system, make it more micronutrient rich, accessible to the poor, and, and, uh, and focus on equity in these aspects. So the main conclusion basically is that food-based approach should not be an afterthought. It should be at the basis of, of a, a, every national strategy to improve life on the When I hear you speaking about uh, the poor people and everybody should have basically just good food, I'm always wondering when I go into the third world and see if people are coming out of that lower end of poverty, they are, from my perspective, uh, victims of the marketing machinery. So you, they're caught by all the bad brands, you know, and, and then that, that gain is lost. So shouldn't maybe your approaches consider on uh, how to tackle actually this, this pitfall, this challenge there with those brands that sell off the, the bad food? Yes, definitely. Um, and, and this is a very, very difficult nut to crack. We know that there is very little... Um, 
learning from developed countries or countries in transition about what works to prevent uh, countries in transition to go from undernutrition directly into overnutrition and, and obesity, overweight, and, and risk of chronic diseases. We know that uh, there is no healthy medium. They just go straight from not having enough to eat to eating the wrong types of food and eating way too many calories and and getting into the overweight and obesity uh, cycle. So unfortunately, we don't have good examples of, of how to ensure that this transition goes more smoothly into into health. Um, but the the one thing that is common across problems of undernutrition and overnutrition is lack of information. So education is at the absolute center of everything we should do uh, in order for people to have a lot more good knowledge and information about what they should eat and what they shouldn't eat and what do foods contain and what are their requirements um, and, and also how should they feel their, feed their young children. Bad habits start early in life. Uh, we know that with, with preschoolers and, and, and children when they go to school, um, they have to be educated, the mothers have to be educated very early on so that they don't let their children fall into the trap of all uh, responding to all the marketing of, of junk food. But it is a, a very, very big um, agenda for research and for implementation. And I have to say that generally donors have not been so interested in this in this area. Uh, and so this is understudied, and, and uh, especially in transition countries and poor countries. So maybe maybe supporting consumer awareness programs, not just education, but consumer awareness campaigns, and maybe even legislation could be could be yeah. part of of the agenda. And maybe that will be something. Now we come into the last questions, you know, where you think what donors could be doing, and you pointed at that already that donors have not been so reactive on that. Maybe you can tell us a little bit why you think that is and how that could be overcome. Maybe that legislation on consumer awareness. Yeah, uh, the whole food system uh, is where to start with, and, and it's very complex. But, uh, I mean, I think donors have separated, uh, as many of us, even researchers, have separated um, the issues related to undernutrition from those related to overweight and obesity. Basically, uh, consumer awareness, as you say, and, and education, um, and and, uh, and and all of the behavior change strategies are part of, of this continuum. If people are more informed, they will know that fruit and vegetables are good for you, whether you're undernourished or you're eating too many calories. But again, uh, behavior change communication and education and, and all of those things are not very sexy for donors, and this is not uh, a magic bullet. And so we've had donors that were not really interested in, in you know, funding large uh, uh, endeavors to improve people's knowledge or, or to, to disseminate information. But we are behind on that. We are not very effective. When you see how effective the, the, the food industry is at marketing their products, why aren't we as good at marketing the diets, or not marketing, but at, at, at trying to influence diets. So that's certainly one area where, where donors could contribute. We have a long way to go to understand and, and, and develop the methodologies to track what, what are the impacts of food systems on nutrition. And, and things like legislate, legislation, different uh, fat tax or tax on, on junk food, uh, the, the whole issue of breastfeeding uh, and, and having a maternity leave in, 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 uh, in, in place of work. And so there are lots of, of policies that are tried here and there or, or, or legislation, um, but we don't know their impact because it's very complex to track down the impact. And I think this is an area where we need to work better, to work more on developing those methods to understand the impacts of different changes in the, in the food systems and their impact on nutrition. I want to wrap it up pretty short with a question that has maybe a slight comment to it. Do you think that maybe in the, in the donor world, there's not enough expertise uh, on behavior change communications and that 
maybe institutions like you should be working on on getting that expertise in there and informing people of what the added value of behavior change is? That's a very good point. I had never thought of it that way. But even in places like uh, our research institute, we're also not really experts uh, in in, uh, in behavior change communication at all. We, we do research, but we have not done any research on specifically uh, on, on what are the best approaches. Uh, it's, it's a different field. It's, uh, we need to borrow from other fields of education and uh, adult education and, uh, and, and learn from, as we said, the private sector on, on how you change people's behavior. And so it's really not just among the donors. It's also among the, the, the whole nutrition community. Uh, that I think we need we need to um, learn from other sciences on, on how to do this better and how to evaluate it, um, and and that's that's a long way to go. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you.